So in the, epi- in the epistle, excuse me, to the Ephesians, Paul, or perhaps some other author, uh, implores the church to remain faithful uh, in a time of difficulty for Christians. So they were being persecuted by the Roman Empire. And he prays that Christ would empower their faith, uh, rooting and grounding them in love uh, for all people. And this would happen when they open themselves up to the fullness of God's love for them. And in that love, they would come to understand God's nature. And that nature transcends human knowledge. Now, to me, the idea of transcending human knowledge is a lot like saying what you've written off, what you've taken for granted, locked up, know for sure, that God is going to show you that you've missed a couple of things, that you haven't accounted for all the angles. So don't assume or you'll, and you know how the rest of that goes, right? Out of you and me, yeah. For those who have forgotten their youth, feel free to ask around why Pastor Lem paused right there. All right. So this was what the ministry of Jesus was all about, which was reminding folks that what might appear to be God acting in a new way was really God's intent all along. And maybe we just didn't have the full picture. Or worse, maybe we didn't want it, which can be a sad and, frankly, occasionally terrifying thing. The nature of God, as I understand it from Scripture, is openness, generosity, and love. So God calls us to have the kind of faith necessary to live like that. We are to emulate God in Christ in that way. Now, I'm wrapping up my first sermon series with you, and this was all on the nature of calling. Today, we're going to talk about a critical concept in Christianity that defines everything we believe in and everything that we do. So you just heard the story of the feeding of the 5,000, maybe not your first time, but that story actually didn't start near the Sea of Galilee. It started in a little town called, and I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong, sorry, uh, called Baal Shalisha. The town's location is disputed by biblical scholars, but it figures prominently in the story of the prophet Elisha. Is that name familiar to you, Elisha? That was Elijah's disciple and successor. You might remember the chariot of fire and Elijah gets swept up into heaven. Elisha, his disciple, takes over as prophet of Israel. Now, here's how the story goes. A man from the town, Baal Shalisha, brought Elisha 20 loaves of barley bread. By the way, same bread as the story, barley bread. Baked from the first ripe grain. That's literally the words of scripture. And brought along some of the heads of new grain. All this is very important to Jews. The first fruits, as it's sometimes called, an offering to God. Uh, Now, the prophet told the man when he was to bless the food and, and offer it to God, honoring God, he said, the first thing he says is, give these gifts to the people that they might have something to eat. So the man's servant replied, how can I set this before a hundred men? That's a good question, right? I mean, 20 loaves of bread, and we're not talking big loaves like you get in the grocery store. We're talking buns, right? 20 loaves of barley bread, a couple of heads of grain, and there were about a hundred or so folks in front of this servant. Well, let me put it to you a different way. It's not our problem today. There's lots of food today. But let's say, oh, you'd signed up for coffee hour, right? If someone handed you a single package of cookies and said, hey, um, you know, we don't really have anything to offer right now except maybe these cookies for fellowship time. Why don't you take these downstairs to the fellowship hall and set them out for the congregation to munch on after church? How many people are there in here right now? (laughs) One package of cookies. No, kitchen crew, you'd never allow something like that to happen. I know. 
But yeah, like uh, asking someone to do something like that might be a little confusing, might even make them a little irate, right? There's just not enough cookies in the pack for even half the people in here. Now, as I get older, I become increasingly convinced that the human mind understands scarcity a whole lot more than it does abundance. I don't think we get abundance. Here's an example. Let's say, oh, you need corn for a barbecue, right? We're doing a lot of that right now. So you, what do you do? You go to the store or the country stand, and you come upon a heap of corn there, lots of corn. What do you do? Well, you and you pick and you find the right ones to take home. And maybe you even know how to pick the right ones, right? Like not all of us do. And you, in your mind, have taken home the best of the lot, however many that is. So what about the hundred or so other people that are going to come in behind you looking for their corn? Are they just getting your leftovers? Is that what it is? Are, are, are all the ones you discarded as unsuitable, only suitable for them? Now, let's turn that around. Let's say you're a guest at that barbecue and you note that, you know, hey, these guys, they put out some fresh corn for me to eat. Yum, yum. But wait, there's like 20 people at this thing? And that platter on that table has 10 cobs of corn, right? Some underestimating has been done here. Well, what's your instinct? Well, if you're like me, you start eyeing up that platter, something awful. Uh, you're taking note of your surroundings. Oh, is anyone making a move over, you know, towards the corn? How am I going to approach this nicely so I don't seem gluttonous, you know? And depending on who you are, maybe not so nicely, right? You're sizing everything up. You're taking in all the information before you develop your plan of attack. Are you seeing a distinction between those two scenarios? In the first example, one of abundance, heaps of corn. You're looking at a pretty brainless activity, right? Like if you've been picking corn your whole life, you kind of have a sense of what you should or should not be taken home. There's corn aplenty, so your mind is not really engaged. But in the second example, oh boy, you're firing on all cylinders, right? You're focused, your, your senses are tuned. When you put a bunch of people together with their minds set on scarcity, it can be a dangerous thing. Day after Thanksgiving, anyone, right? Sure, my example uh, might be a little humorous, right, with the, the corn and all, but there's nothing humorous about a half-starved person desperate for something to eat, living in a society where people throw away perfectly good food just because it didn't suit their sensibilities, just because there weren't enough mouths to eat it. Now the prophet Elisha, who knows God's nature, God is literally talking to the man, is unconcerned with the visible statistics of exactly how much or how little food is available for the people present. His only concern is ensuring that people are fed because God wants them fed. God literally says it in scripture. And let me tell you, when God acts, God makes leftovers. So he tells the man from Baal Shalisha this, for this is what the Lord says, they will eat and have some leftover. Words of the text. The nature of God is love. That's what we believe. And out of that love is justice. Now, justice is just the name we give to the state in which everyone has what they need and everyone is being treated fairly. Now, some might call this a state of abundance. Some might even call it a state of paradise. But I really don't think that's true. And frankly, I think that's sad commentary about the times that we live in. We know abundance. We know it very well. And we know it when we see it. We have some idea of what paradise might be for us. And how often have you thought about your own personal paradise and found it unattainable? Injustice occurs because, well, we don't live in paradise. 
We don't live in a state of justice. Injustice comes from a sense of scarcity, and sometimes it comes from a perceived sense of scarcity. Too many people looking at the same platter of corn, sizing it up, each with their different levels of tolerance over what misdeed they might be willing to do to get their advantage, to fill their plate with corn. Now, in the letter to the Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, uh, we find the classic definition of faith in the Christian sense. Uh, and these are the words from chapter 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is not born out of scarcity. In fact, a mind set on scarcity might not have it in them to set their mind on Jesus. Now, there's nothing wrong with questioning where God is when injustice occurs, of course, but when we up and decide that there's simply no God because we have become victims of injustice, well, it becomes clear to anyone that the victim has no faith. That's not something to judge, by the way. It is something to lament if you're a faithful person because the victim has lost hope and has placed their faith in the tangible, you know, the consistent, the dependable, even if that thing or situation is very bad for them. Addiction, anyone? Why would they risk their heart being shattered once more by doing something as foolish as hoping? Now, God calls us to set our minds not only on justice, but abundance. God makes leftovers. In these feeding miracles of Elisha and Jesus, we see in both cases that God not only supplies the people with everything they need, but does so to overflowing. A person could take to scripture for a long while to understand why God would do that. And let me tell you, it would not be a wasted effort. That's worthy of study. Now, the command from God is clear. You give them something to eat. It's not, okay, let's get a head count, you know. Let's see how much we got. Oh, not enough. No. God is not operating on a human level. So fixated on what's lacking. We're being asked to place our trust in something that's beyond our knowing, maybe even a leap of faith, because God wants to work wonders through us instead of in spite of us. If we can't help but rely on the strength of these two hands, and hey, some of us don't even have two of them, and we do that most days, we will miss out on the companionship and power that God extends to the faithful. And I understand it's a vulnerable position to be in. Siblings in Christ asking people who have no hope to have hope, that's a tall order. Trusting that God will accompany us when we try to help people find hope is a big ask. It's a calling. And as we know, God calls in all kinds of ways. And God don't make mistakes about who God calls. A hundred men gathered before that prophet, 5,000 or more gathered before Jesus, but only one of their number had the kind of faith that led to action to try to do something. Sometimes, to solve a problem, you have to trust that you'll find the answer somewhere in the process. You don't need to have all the answers or even a great sense of direction, really. Sometimes getting started is enough. You've probably heard that a couple times. This is what God asks of us, to get started and see what happens. And that is where people find hope. Hope is not just a state of being. 
It is fostered and it grows. The Lord above wants people fed in the literal sense, yes, but also in the general sense. Because as our gospel reading says at the end, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world, meaning the Messiah. The people found hope, not just because of what Jesus did, not just because they enjoyed a seafood buffet, but because his disciples took the time to listen and have faith and start handing the food out. God is revealed in the actions of the faithful, and that's how God gets the glory. When people have given up on God, when they've given up on hope, when they find those things, it's a beautiful thing. You've probably seen it happen in your own life. Maybe it's happened to you. And it's also like entering into an entirely different world of possibility. It's where optimism has grown. Now, we do a lot of feeding here at Epworth, and we do that in our own way. And we've done it a lot over the years. You can never know how many lives you've touched or saved in your actions, but God knows. And we have a whole lot more folks out there who need to know about God's justice, too. Yes, we might seem small. We might not think we have enough. But we can never know what God is doing in the background when we're so certain of our outcome. Sometimes all that's needed are a few loaves and fish to start something miraculous. Miraculous to us, but to God it might just be another Sunday. May the Lord of hosts refresh your faith. May God open your hearts and minds that you would answer when called. To God be the glory, and amen.